We are really glad you're here. I'm Ray Johnson. I'm one of the pastors around here. I want to invite you to reach in and uh, grab this message outline if you've got it. If you've got a Bible, turn to the book of Romans chapter 4. So while you're getting set for all that, I just want to say this. Um, who was here last week and heard Mark Clark do Romans chapter 3? Okay. Mark, you're somewhere over there, I think. Great job. Would you all agree? Great job teaching. Um, however, have you ever wondered, like, okay, pastors on Sunday morning, you see what they do, right? What do they do on Friday night? Like, what does Mark do on Friday night? <laughs> and, um, and so I just thought I would give you a little insight into what Mark does on Friday night. Um, we had a special needs prom right here on Friday night, which is awesome, okay? Um, and it's this huge prom for some of God's favorite people. And Mark and his wife went to the prom, so did Andrew and Isabel, and spent the entire night. And Mark was dancing with a whole bunch of these kids. Anybody here want to see Mark's dancing skills in action? All right, roll it. You can tell she's thrilled. And you know, by the way, you know what I love about that? What I love about that is this, okay? When pastors preach, they should mean what they say when they're preaching, but they should live what they say when they're not preaching. And Mark, you do that very well. So congratulations. Um, and um, if you got a Bible, go to Romans chapter four. Uh, I'm going to put a picture of a guy up on a screen. I want to know, does anybody know who this guy is? Okay, anybody know that guy? That guy, his name's Saeed Katab, and he has had a profound impact on your life. Okay, even though the guy died 60 years ago, he's, he has influenced you for one reason, because of his worldview. Okay, no wonder he was a, Saeed Kitab was a radical Egyptian politician, okay, and basically was a fascist. He and Hitler read a lot of the same books, and he developed a worldview of hatred and violence. He hated all Christians, hated all Jews, and despised the West, okay? His thoughts provoked so much violence in Egypt that they finally jailed him him, and that's the picture of him in jail, and then they, he continued to sort of do that, so they put him to death about 60 years ago, and that's all you would have ever heard of Saeed Kitab, except he had a brother named Muhammad Kitab, and Muhammad took his insane worldview of hatred, violence, and kill everybody, and he took that to Saudi Arabia, and he started teaching in a university there. Now, what happened is this. He taught there. You've never heard of Muhammad Kitab, Saeed Kitab, but you may have heard of Muhammad Kitab's all-star pupil, a guy named Osama bin Laden. And Osama bin Laden took that worldview of hatred and violence towards Christian Jews in the West and put it into action. And today, we live in the age of terrorism because of the worldview of one guy that died 60 years ago. Every time you go to an airport, every time you have to take off your shoes, every time you have to wait in line. Does anybody hate TSA? I mean, you're, you're sitting there going, this is insane, okay? Every single time that happens, you're there. That's the power of one person's worldview. Now, all of you have something in common. You ready? All of you have a worldview. All of you do. Okay? Now, what is a worldview? If you're taking notes, write this down some more. I'm going to give you a definition. A worldview, here it is, it's simply this. It's the beliefs you base your life on. It's the beliefs you, it's how I view everything in life. Your worldview determines how you think about life, how you think about death, how you think about money, how you think about your past, your present, and your future. Your, by the way, your worldview is a huge thing. It determines whether you're happy or not. It determines how you feel about life. It determines whether you have peace or mind. Uh, your stress level is all about your worldview. Your confidence level is all about your worldview. And I got really good news. And Romans chapter four, in my opinion, is the best worldview shaping passage in the entire Bible. 
Paul is writing the book of Romans. And he, by the way, he introduces you to a whole bunch of people in Romans. Check this out. Here's sort of a chart, and it's four different worldviews in the book of Romans, okay? You got the rebellious hedonists. That's the first part of Romans. And by the way, anybody, do we have any of those folks in America today? They basically disregard God and party their way through life. Sound familiar? Or he says there's a second thing, and that's a respectable judgmentalist. And they distract God by judging everybody and comparing everybody. We got any Christians like that running around loose? Or the third category in Romans worldview is this. It's the religious legalist. I'm impressed by God and do enough works to save myself, which is why Paul wrote the book of Romans. Or you've got a grace-driven Christian that has a whole different worldview. I'm gonna love God and trust God and entrust myself to God. Now, why is that a big deal? Chapter four will shape how you feel about God. It'll, it'll shape how you feel about your future. Chapter four will shape how you view the Christian faith, how you view it, and how you treat other people will all be determined by chapter four. Because chapter four asks two massive questions. Look up here. Chapter four asks two massive questions, and there they are. Number one is this. If I've wrecked my life, can I find God's grace for my past and be completely forgiven and freed? And if so, do I have to work for it and, or can I receive it? Chapter four answers that. Second question is this. If my future looks really limited, how do I access the power of God for my future? So the first half is this. How do I access the grace of God to get free? And then how do I access the power of God to get fueled and go forward? And that's dispatcher. And Mark, I love what you do with this screen because I was watching Mark with his screen last week, which by the way, this is, we've never had this thing before. This is an insanely expensive screen, okay? And Brian Jenkins went and got it for free. Isn't that awesome? If you want one, it'll cost you a ton of money. Um, and um, the neat thing is this. I was watching Mark use this screen, and I went, you could do the same thing with your Bible. You realize you can actually go home, open your Bible, and draw all over it. Okay? So I'm going to walk you through these verses. You all ready? Okay? The first part of chapter 4 is this. It's what is the opposite of faith, which is instead of grace, I work for it. And we're going to start with this. Okay? Chapter, first three chapters, he's unleashing salvation and justification by faith. And then he gets to chapter 4 and he goes, I better give an example. Let me give an example of somebody everybody's heard. And here he goes. What shall we say then that who's the example about? Abraham. Now, Abraham is a big deal. All three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all trace their roots to Abraham, okay? Abraham, our forefathers, according to the flesh, what did he discover in this matter? Now, this is a really big deal, the word discover, which is gonna happen to you this morning. What did he discover in this matter? In fact, Abraham was, if in fact, Abraham was justified by what? Works. Then he's got something to boast about, but not before God. What is it? What does Scripture say? This is awesome. There are two huge words. If you've got a Bible, circle them in your Bible. Abraham believed God. So the first word is? Believed. Abraham believed God, and this is a heavyweight theological term, and it was credited to him. You earn it, or somehow it's credited into your account, and you get it for free. Credited to him as righteous. Now, where, where did all this come from? Okay, so I'm going to take you out of Romans, back to Genesis for a second, okay? After this, this is Genesis chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. God said, now, <laughs> well, God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. God took him outside. Check it out. It says, Abram, look at the heavens. Count the stars. If indeed you can count them, so shall your offspring be. That sounds really cool, huh? Abraham, you're going to be a dad. You're going to have so many kids, it's going to drive you crazy. They're going to become teenagers. He goes, you're going to have so many kids your descendants will be multiplied and millions of people like the stars. You know the problem with that is? Abraham's 85 years old. His wife is 85 years old and barren. So God gives him a promise that looks what? Flat out impossible. However, here's Abram's response. It says this, Abram believed, and by the way, that's the first time belief is in the Bible. Abraham believed the Lord, and here it is again. It was what? 
credited to him as righteousness. Now, the word credited is a big deal, okay? It's a Greek term. It's an accounting term. It means something's credited to you accounting-wise. It is used 41 times in the New Testament. It is used 19 times in Romans, and it's used 11 times just in this chapter. Now, where does that come from? Glad you asked. You go to the next set of verses here, back to Romans. Verse four says this. Now, here's the way you earn. You either earn it, or are gifted it. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift. You either receive it as a gift or as an obligation, okay? However, to the one who does not work, but trust God, and here's a great phrase, trust God who does what? Justifies the ungodly. That means I qualify. Anybody else? The, and then it says this, he justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Now, he's pulling out this heavyweight stuff. He's going, Abraham, you can actually receive forgiveness instead of work and earn it, okay? And then he goes, I better come up with another example. Like, who's the other heavyweight in the Bible? So he goes, example number two, it is, it's David, okay? Now, what was going on with David is this. David is king of Israel, and he's on his rooftop one day. And all of his armies are out fighting, but he stayed home because he's lazy. And he's sitting on the rooftop, and he looks down and sees another whoop. And there's a woman on, and she's gorgeous. And he calls these guys and says, hey, go get her to me. She's married. That didn't bother him a bit. She brought him in. He has sex with her. She gets pregnant, and he has her husband killed. Anybody here done that? <laughs> if so, you're getting arrested today. Okay, so David is like, hey, go get her, bring her here, arrange us to have her husband killed, and then she ends up coming with him, okay? This is serious stuff with any, at any time and season, this is serious stuff with God. David is confronted about this. So it says this, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God, what? Credits righteousness apart from your works and actions. And this is, and then in Romans, he quotes Psalm 32. Psalm 32, David is confronted, he's discovered, and he repents and he comes back to God. Psalm 32 is this incredible psalm. I've probably read it a thousand times. It is David's prayer for forgiveness and freedom from his past. And here's what he says. Blessed are those who are religious. Blessed are those who are perfect. No, it says, blessed are those whose transgressions are what? Forgiven, whose sins are covered forever. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never, this is awesome, never count against them. You and I are gonna have a worldview of the grace of God which will free you or I've got a work for it which will enslave you and turn you into a judgmental work. And how you view the church, how you view the, your future, how you view the Christian faith, is all, this worldview it goes in two separate directions. Um, for example, Raymond, I have a, um, I was driving I spoke at a leadership conference in uh, Alabama and I'm driving and I drive by a church. So, and I see a sign on their door, but I can't see it from the street. So I pull in, okay? And this is a church and here is their welcome sign on their front door. That's the front door to the church. And I pull in, I get out with my phone and I take a picture of that. The wages of sin is death. Welcome to our church. All you need to know about the worldview of that church, they have put on the front door. The wages of sin is death. You're a sinner. You're going to die. God hates you. Okay? Now, that's, put that back up for a second. Here, I actually took that picture. I was going to go in and talk to the staff. And, and then, but the door was locked. Nobody's home because nobody goes there. And <laughs> the, because I was, here's what I was going to say. By the way, the wages of sin is death. Is that in the Bible? Yeah, last week, Romans 3. However, if you are going to put that verse on the front door of your church, for God's sake, put the whole verse, which says the wages of sin are death. 
but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And when you are grace-based and that's your worldview, it changes everything. And if you are works and earn it, it wrecks everything. Make sense? Distorts everything. I'll give you a great example. I saw it in living color two weeks ago right here. Okay. We, um, we were doing the Thrive Conference. It was packed. We had a couple hundred youth pastors there. And somebody came backstage and they said, hey, it was unbelievable, man. I just met with this youth pastor. He's going through some really rough times. He's a youth pastor in this, in this vicinity. He works in a tough area of town. He's a newlywed. He's just really bummed and discouraged. But he's, come, he's just kind of hoping this conference revitalize him a little bit. And we said, what's up? And he said, well, the latest thing to hit this poor guy is this. Um, he's a poverty-stricken youth pastor. And um, he found out his car needed repairs. I didn't have any money for that anyway, but he took it in hoping it would be cheap. And he just got a text from the car thing while he was here. And it said the repairs are between five and $6,000. And this poor kid just broke and he's like, I don't have the money now, I don't have a car. You can't do youth ministry without a car. So he tells, he tells his youth pastor, would you just be praying for me? He goes, because the car's only worth two grand anyway. Because he's a youth pastor. And, and so we go, so I go, hey, go get him. So he comes backstage, have a conversation, just great heart for God, nicest guy in the world, newlywed, horrible times. I remember some of these days. I was a youth pastor. And, and so I said, are you in the next session? Big old session in here. So he said, yeah. The afternoon session, I interrupt worship. Come out, no problem. Interrupt worship, come out here. And he's right over there. Grab he and Colton Tucker. And I said, would you just stand right here? And during this next worship song, I told his whole story. And I said, this guy's a newlywed. He's got this kind of stuff. Why don't we help him? Let's unleash grace and generosity to this guy. And so during this next worship song, you're all standing anyway. If you want to help this guy, just come forward and give him any amount of money you can afford to give him. And let's just bless this kid. And it starts worshiping. My estimation is a thousand people came forward. And I'm standing here, what? It, they had to roll through one worship song, another worship song. People are hugging him. He's crying. I mean, you could just watch this guy's spirit soar back up. And they're putting money and dollars in this buckets, all this kind of stuff. And then we also said, hey, get out your phones, go online if you want to give. And so all the introverts stayed where they were and did that. The, <laughs> And so what happens is he goes, I go backstage and I go, hey, how, how was the giving? And they go, better than you think. And he said, we, we still counting it, okay? So I call him up and I go, can you be in the service with us tonight and can you bring your wife? He calls her and he calls me and he goes, yeah, we'll both be there. I said, perfect, okay? Um, and so interrupt worship again, bring he and his wife up. They are standing right here. And she's the cutest thing you've ever seen. They're just this amazing newlywed couple standing there. She's already teared up because he's told her what we were doing. And I just said to them, you know, when you do this kind of thing, you just hope, you know, people are generous. And, you know, you hope two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 comes in. And she gets teared up at the thought of three or $4,000 maybe coming their way. That would really lift them out of this pit. And I said, well, I just wanted to tell you, um, they did not give $1,000. They didn't give 2000 they didn't give 3000 they didn't give 4000 they didn't give 5000 they didn't give 6000 they did not give 7000 they did give $20,750 she i mean they're both bawling she almost collapses and um and then what happens is we said, and as God would have it, this is John. He is from our Orange County Bayside. He's at the conference here. He owns four car dealerships. He came backstage and said, just send them down. We'll run it up to $25,000 and we'll get them a car. So we said, look, you two have had a horrible year. We said this, here's a, you're newlyweds. You need to get away. Our pastors have chipped in. We, have got, we are buying you two Southwest tickets to Orange County. We have got a hotel room for you so you can go down there and spend a weekend. You're your newlyweds. Get away, okay? And then our Orange County Church will host you on Sunday morning, and then you, we're not getting you plane tickets back because you were going to drive your new car home, okay? This is happening, people, right now. Right now. Down there, that's their car and the thing. Now, 
Why am I telling you, why am I telling you that whole thing? Because here's what happens is when you work for something, you feel like I've earned it and what's wrong with everybody else. When you do nothing but receive something by grace, you are filled with joy and gratitude and that spills out and you become an emotionally, the only emotionally healthy people are grace-based people. And as much as we poured grace on that youth pastor, Romans makes crystal clear, God wants to pour 50 times that grace on you. Everybody got that? Now, that's the first half of this chapter. It answers the question, can I access God's grace for my past? Then you go, wait a second, I actually got to live going forward. Can I access God's grace for my past? The answer is yes. How do I access God's grace for my future? How do I access the presence and power of God for my future? In other words, what kind of faith not just fixes my past, what kind of faith will give me a future I could never have anywhere else? And that is back to Abraham, and here we go. Y'all still with me? Okay, here we go, okay? Therefore, and I'm gonna give you some key words here. Therefore, the promise. Abraham, you're gonna have kids. I know you're 85, this doesn't look good. But he says the promise comes by what? Faith, so that it may be grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, which is true. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he what? Believed the God. And what kind of God did Abraham believe in? And what kind of God frees you for a future you could never have? And there's two great descriptions of God in here. Y'all ready? Number one is this, God who gives life to the dead. And I love this, calls into being things that were not. God gives life to the dead and calls into being things that are not. That's a, those are the two that he basically, what kind of God do we have? He calls life, he basically creates life out of something that's dead. That's called the resurrection. And resurrection, hey, he can raise a dead marriage. That makes sense? He gives life to the dead and he calls into being things that were not. In other words, and there's a key word here. Okay, here, you ready? Here it is. It says, he calls. He calls. This is about the power of God's voice. Whenever God speaks, something gets created. How did God create light? God said, let there be light. And light was created. How did life happen? God said, let there be life. And life was created. Whenever God speaks, something gets... Uh, you are way sharper than this. Whenever God speaks, something gets created. Okay? Which me, That's why I'm glad you're here. Okay? Because you come in here... The Bible speaks, it's the voice of God. God speaks, and some of you walked in here discouraged. God speaks, hope gets created. And then you have a future. God speaks, transformation gets created. Whenever God speaks, something gets created. Now, let me ask a quick question. Was Abraham some kind of Superman, 85 years old, becomes a dad? Was he some kind of Superman? No. Are you all ready? This is huge. Abraham did two things and it unlocked the power of God for his future. If you will do these same two things, it will unlock the power of God for your future, whether you're a teenager or whether you're 85 years old. The first thing Abraham did, just write down the word promises. Number one is this. He based his life, his future, and his worldview not on his circumstances, but on the promises of God. Okay, let me back this up one. Against all hope. I, by the way, I love this phrase, against all hope. Anybody been there in the last two years? You're like, I just give up. I'm hopeless about whatever it is. Against all hope, notice what it says. Against all hope, Abraham quit. Against all hope, Abraham said, I'm moving to Texas. Against all hope, no, it says this, against all hope. What do you do when you've completely lost hope? Against all hope, Abraham in hope, believed and became. Now, if you have a Bible, write it down. He believed and became. I will never become until I first believe. 
I will never become until I first believe. As he basically said, I am going to believe the promises of God that frees me up to become the father of many nations, just as it had been. There's the voice of God again. Said to him, get your Bible, crack it open, grab a pen, destroy your Bible, just like we're doing on this screen, okay? And get the promises of God in your life, because when you believe, that triggers everything you need to become. Got it? Okay, that's huge. The second thing is this. He based his future hope on the promise of God. Second thing is this, okay? We're gonna put it up on the screen. Second thing is this. He looked beyond his circumstances. He looked beyond his circumstances, and check this out. Without weakening in his faith, and I love this phrase. I was an atheist growing up. I thought you Christians were closed-minded morons who completely ignored the facts. I love this. Without weakening his face, he faced the fact. Isn't that cool? He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. We have anybody here that's in like high 90s? That would have been awesome. We were going to give you a crib. The, um, about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet, this is awesome, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. See that word promise? Regarding the promise of God, but was what? Strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. In other words, see this word strengthen and see this word promise and see this word weak and see this word promise. I am going to be weak if I ignore the promise of God. I can be much stronger if I access the promise of God. That's, I want to give you three quick points and then I'm going to bring out a couple and interview them to see if this works in real life. Okay, point number one is this. Okay, Abraham, without weakening his face, faced the facts. Um, number one, what is authentic faith? First one is this, faith is not pretending. It's not saying there's no problems. Faith is not living in fantasy land. Biblical faith is facing the facts, but not letting the facts derail your faith that God is gonna keep his promises. I'm gonna say it again, biblical faith is facing facts, but not letting the facts derail your faith that God is gonna keep his promises. Because faith doesn't see less, faith sees more. Got that? Second thing I wanna tell you is this, okay? Another way to put it is this, faith doesn't ignore reality. Faith is not reordering, it's not pretending everything is okay. Faith is facing the facts straight on, but not letting those facts drive you into the disillusionment and discouragement of life. Okay, third is this, and this is huge. Faith is believing, y'all ready? Faith is believing that God is working when it doesn't look like God is working at all. Faith is believing that God is sometimes working best when it doesn't look like God is working at all. So I just thought we'd see if this works in real life. So would you all give a huge Bayside welcome to Alan and Christina Holt from Orange County. Welcome them up. All right. Okay. Hey guys, this is the 945 service. They're generally the most alive service. It didn't look like it from that reception. So let's try that again, okay? All right. Hey, first of all, welcome. We are, thanks for flying in. You, you, um, the, I'm gonna dive right into this. First of all, introduce yourselves. Yeah, I am Alan Holt, and this is my wife, Christina. Hello. And we are on staff. Uh, I'm the worship pastor uh, down in our Orange County campus, and we've been uh, on staff and a part of Bayside for almost a year. August will be a year, so it's going really great. Yeah, Orange County is crushing it, so it's fun. That's awesome. And um, Christina, you were born in Virginia Beach, but years later, you moved to New York. Um, can you tell us the story of how that happened? Yeah, um, so I was born and raised in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and uh, about nine years ago, I was married to my first husband, and then about eight years ago, we had our first baby. Um, her name is Roma, and she's now seven and a half years old, um, but when she was two months old, 
my husband started complaining about these minor headaches. And within a few days, he had suddenly passed away. Um, don't know why, um, but he passed away. And I go from being a newlywed and new mom at 23 years old to now a widow, single mom to a two-month-old baby at 23 years old. And for me, I had hit rock bottom. That was, if there was anything that looked like rock bottom, that was it. And I had every, I had every reason to be mad at God and want to blame God and be bitter towards God. But with my little baby, I felt like I had these two choices that I can make. I, I could choose to be bitter and blame God or I could choose the other, I could choose life and I could choose to still believe that, that God is good and that he still has a purpose for me and a purpose for Roma um, and that there's purpose in this pain that I was feeling. Um, and over the next two years, I was stay, I was still in Virginia Beach at the time and I was going through the process of grief and I was just in this constant cycle of sadness and depression and I felt like I was just hitting this wall and I just felt stuck and I got to a point in my spirit, I was like, God, I don't, I don't want this anymore. I, I love my family, but I can't be stuck in this cycle anymore. It's, I want out. I want something different. I know that you have something more for me in Roma. So what I did from that point on was call up all my friends and uh, ask them if, you know, I, if we could come visit. And I had one of my best friends was living in New York City. Uh, she had an extra room and she was like, yeah, we'd love to have you guys. And I was like, well, I'm going to bring my two, my two-year-old toddler. I hope that's okay too. Um, and she was like, yeah, sure. Come on up. We'd love to have you. Um, so we hopped in the car. I put uh, Roma in the back seat of our little Toyota Prius and we drove away from Virginia. And I remember feeling the, a layer being lifted off of my shoulders. And it was just an immediate lift. And to me, that felt like I didn't know where exactly we were going to end up, but that was God telling me, you're heading in the right direction. And over the course of traveling and visiting my friends, me and Roma were alone a lot. And um, we spent a lot of you know time together, just the two of us. But I used that time to really um, get deeper with God. And I wanted to hear from God and I wanted to get to know God on another level. And what that looked like for me was listening to worship music and I read my Bible and I read scripture and I wanted to fill my mind and my thoughts with biblical truth. And eventually I got to a place where I realized that he was all I needed. Everything that I wanted and needed through this season of grief, he had exactly all of it. He had the comfort that I needed. He had the love that I needed. And most of all, he had the hope that I needed. And because of the choices that I had made along the journey, it changed the course of my life forever and our life forever. And I wouldn't be here today with him if I hadn't had made those choices. And we wouldn't have three beautiful children who are to us a testimony to God's faithfulness in our lives. So um, I have friends that tragedy hit. They run away from God, filled with bitterness for the rest of their life, um, become an atheist. You know, all, all, how could you know that stuff? You went the other direction on that one. Um, why did you do that? And what does that mean? Well, I grew up in a Christian home, so my family, uh, I grew up in church, and my family instilled the legacy of faith in who I am, and I knew how important it was to have faith even when it hurts and even when it got tough, and it got really tough, um, but 
I had seen within my family and outside of my family and all throughout the Bible that what it looks like to run away from God, what it can do to you and what can it do and what it can do to your family. And again, I, I looked at my daughter and I was like, I don't want that. She doesn't deserve that. She deserves a mom who's full of faith, who's gonna still choose to trust God even when it hurts. And I chose to run to God and it was the best decision that I made because it's, it's, it has carried me through the processes of grief um, that nothing else can do. Um, first of all, thanks for sharing all this. Um, the, I have a picture, okay? So, okay, what's happening here? Yeah, so this is uh, our first dance, and it's also me, like, super excited to get out of there pretty quick, if you know what I mean. <laughs> That's a great wedding picture. Um, all right, so I have a second picture, and Alan, would you explain this picture? This, yeah. By the way, get out your Kleenex. This is really cool. If you're single, would you raise your hand? Good. Guys, take notes. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, but probably the, uh, the, the best thing that I've done in our marriage so far was um, it's carried me for five years. So like, it, like legit now, I probably have to think of something really good, you know, coming up. But for five years. So but what I did was through uh, I wanted to do something really special with uh, our rings. And so I went and I asked every single uh basically woman in my family who had prayed for my wife. And so I went like my grandmothers and my mom and my sister and anyone I could think of that played a part in praying for my wife. And I asked if they had any old jewelry that they would give me because I wanted to melt it down and create our rings from it just because I, there was a legacy of prayer there. And so um, this, this picture is, uh, I knew the... I didn't really know the weight, but I knew to a certain degree of what it meant to Mary Christina. And that means, you know, Roma and the whole thing. And I wanted to make sure. So I had a, a little ring for her maid. And yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that she knew that like, um, that she was taking care of, that not only was I marrying her mom, but I was marrying her too for life and that I was going to get to be her daddy. And so that was me kind of proposing uh, and giving Roma a ring as well. Um, Christina, uh, the stuff you went through is uh, like unimaginable. Um, is there anything else you want to say? Yeah, I, if there's anything that I have learned from the experience and taken from the experience is that God's love is for you just as much as it is for me. God's peace and his comfort is for you as much as it is for me. And wherever you're at, we're all on a different journey. Whatever your story looks like today, keep believing that God is gonna be faithful. Give him the opportunity to show you that he can give you everything you need. And as much as it might hurt, he's gonna be faithful. So continuing to trust God um, in every season of life that you're in, and he will be faithful in your life. He will be. Can I add to that a little bit? But that's worth clapping for, for sure. One thing that always just kind of blows my mind is, you know, the, for me, the first sight of something going bad, I'm like, I become like doubting Thomas immediately. You know, I'm like, oh my God, are you real? Where are you? You know, come help. And I've always found it extremely fascinating that it, the truth is it's really hard to trust God in those situations. It's extreme. It's not easy. It's like, I think it's one of the hardest things that we can do is to still believe when stuff goes bad and we get a diagnosis or lose a job or something goes wrong, that God is still in our corner and he's still for us. And so I just want you to know that we're not up here saying like, oh yeah, like I'm always baffled by the story, to be honest, because that's why I married her, because I know like if things go south, I know where she's grounded and I know where she's turning, you know, it's true. But I just want to lean into it 
lean into God, don't run away, even though it, it, it might be a lot easier to blame God and say, what in the world, where are you? But the truth is he is there. No matter what your circumstance looks like, lean in, lean into it, lean into him, don't pull away. Even though it, it's really difficult to do, it's the best decision that I believe that we can make. Um, yeah, Carol and I had a ball with you guys at dinner. It was so fun. The um, unpacking the whole thing. Um, the so, next time you're back, we'll have a conversation about your first hug. Um, the uh, for some of you that are going, I don't see any way. My life is such a disaster. I don't see any way there could be a future, which you would have been at heartbreaking a little repeatedly, okay? Um, the, when it looks like that, which it certainly did for Abraham and it certainly did for you, um, God, is, God can work when it doesn't look like that's even a possibility. And, um, and so I thought I'd just show you a last picture and have you talk about who's this. Yeah, so that's Roma uh, in the middle, um, and then that's little Brooklyn. That's our uh, three-year-old. And then that's Virginia, our youngest. And really, it's just a, a picture of God's faithfulness in our lives. And uh, it's just what, what God has done is just pretty, pretty cool. It's awesome. Let's, let's pray together. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes um, and shut everybody around you out, just you and God. And if you're here going, man, the first half of that passage is about grace. I would love to walk out of here knowing I'm forgiven, knowing that I've got a clean slate and a fresh start, knowing that I have a Savior, knowing that I have eternal life, knowing I've got Christ in my life. That can happen right here, right now. And so I'm going to pray a very simple prayer, and I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me because transformation can happen in a moment. So if you're going, I need Christ in my life. I need the presence of God. I need the power of God. I need complete forgiveness. I need a clean slate. I'm going to pray out loud. You pray with me silently, but pray with me right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I believe you died on a cross for me and rose so that I could be forgiven, which means you're right here. So right now I ask you to forgive me for all my sins. I let the past go. Jesus Christ, come into my life. I receive you this morning. Be my Savior, and I will follow you. Be my Lord. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for your love. And if you prayed that prayer, I'm not going to call you out, not going to embarrass you, but while your heads are all bowed, if you prayed that prayer, um, we want to pray for you. I'm going to actually ask, Rome, I'm going to ask Christina to pray for you that the rest of your life ends up being the best of your life. So if you prayed that prayer, would you just raise your hand right now? Just put your hand up. Put, put them way up. There's a ton of you. Awesome, awesome awesome. Um, and then one last question. The second half of this pa passage is about unlocking the power of God for your future. And if some of you are going, man, I have been going through some really hard times. I just need to have God show up in my life. I need God's support. I need God's presence and power and promises. And I, would you just pray for me as well? Would you raise your hand? Hey, Christine, would you pray for these folks? Lord, um, thank you so much that we get to be here and have an opportunity to, to worship you and give you glory and, um, and be to, together surrounded by other people who are all on a journey as well. Um, whatever their journey looks like, God, everyone has a different story that you are writing for them. I pray that the struggles that they're going through, the pain that they might be suffering, I pray that you will meet them right where they are yes, Lord. and that you will let them know that they are loved and that you have hope to give them and that they're going to be okay. 
and that they can get through it, whatever it is that they're going through, I pray that you will give them the strength to move forward in your faithfulness and your love, Lord. I pray for that this morning. I pray that you will meet them right where they are and just let them know in your way and only the way that you can do it, that you love them and that you're everything they need to get through it. Amen. Amen.